Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, friends and colleagues around the world. And welcome to this webinar, this digital event, Time to Take Action, organized by the Commonwealth Pharmacy Association, CPA, and the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP. My name is Lars Åke Söderlund, and I am a community pharmacist from Stockholm, Sweden, and I am the immediate past president of the community pharmacy section FIP, and currently one of FIP's vice presidents. It's a great privilege for me to be able to co-moderate this event today with Victoria Rutter, Chief Executive Officer of the Commonwealth Pharmacy Association. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. I am very excited about today's event. Our event today is the final one in a series of six events delivered weekly throughout October and November 2022 and centers around preventing antimicrobial resistance together through collaboration, innovation and action, culminating today with this symposium during the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Today we will celebrate the success of the AMS in Action webinar series as we reflect on the great work being done globally to tackle AMR. Victoria will in a short while give us a recap of the previous most successful events. Today, we will also showcase our competition winners who will share their innovation ideas and tools to help support AMS and prevent the spread of AMR. And I am convinced that today's event will be very useful for so many pharmacists in different settings in all pharmacy disciplines. The International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, is the global body representing over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists. We work to meet the world, world's healthcare needs, and FIP is a non-governmental organization that has been in official relations with the World Health Organizations since 1948. Our vision is a world where everyone benefits from access to safe, effective, quality and affordable medicines and health technologies, as well as from pharmaceutical care services provided by pharmacists in collaboration with other healthcare professionals. Our mission is to support global health by enabling the advancement of the pharmaceutical practice, sciences and education. And the issue of AMR and AMS is one that is very close to all of our hearts. And as pharmacists, we have a real responsibility in this area. FIP has been working in this area for many years, culminating in a position statement. And FIP was also pleased to contribute to the World Health Organization's consultations to develop the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance that was subsequently adopted by the 68th World Health Assembly. And since then, FIP has been collaborating with the WHO on the plan's implementation. And FIP continues to facilitate the essential contributions of the pharmacy profession to AMR reduction around the world, for example, through surveillance and monitoring of antimicrobial use and resistance, antibiotics distribution and regulation, and is driving action through the FIP Commission on AMR, which is comprised of pharmacy experts with international reach and diverse backgrounds. And the Commission is imminent. Uh, commission's imminent AMR activities span over education, policy, and public health with related work in the area of vaccination and safety of medicines. And the Commission's work is solely focused on AMS. And they are also in line with the FIP development goal number 17, antimicrobial stewardship. And this development goal is a goal regarding antimicrobial stewardship for the entire profession. And the work of the cons commission is now going to be consolidated into a 12 month program where the commission will set out the training and education needs, raising the advocacy and policies needed in all regions to address AMR. And this is where FIP will focus its attention. Of course, these challenges need to be done in partnership. And this is where we need to collaborate. And Within FIP, we don't seek to duplicate work done by others, but to partner and collaborate when possible to solve these challenges. And we are indeed very proud that CPA has chosen to partner with FIP for this work.
The legacy that CPA has in this area is a huge amount of training resources addressing AMS and to some extent fills in the gaps of FIP. And we are now in a position where we want to make sure that this great work is spread worldwide. So it's really important today that we continue this collaboration in a very meaningful manner. We have been collaborating with the CPA for many years and we now need to deliver the real benefits of all our members worldwide. So now I hand over to you, Victoria. Thanks, Lars. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, thank you for that introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends and colleagues from around the globe. Um, welcome to this last webinar in our AMS in Action series, Time to Take Action, delivered jointly by FIP and CPA. And it's been a pleasure to work with the FIP team on this series. So thank you for this opportunity and, and for the support that you've given us. Um, as Lars said, my name is Victoria Rutter. I'm the CEO of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. And before I hand back to Lars, I'd like to go over um, a little bit about our organisation. So the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association is a charity that was set up in the 1970s with the goal of helping to support the development of the pharmacy profession and the safe and effective use of medicines across the Commonwealth. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Commonwealth is a network of 56 independent countries who've signed up to a charter of shared values, committing to work together to create a better and fairer world for all the citizens of the Commonwealth and progressing the sustainable development goals. The Commonwealth encompasses a third of the global population and some of the poorest nations of the world. And our mission as an organisation is to work in partnership and leverage the strengths of our network to support the development of the pharmacy profession through our relationships with the National Pharmacy Associations of the Commonwealth. As many of you may know, um, low and middle income countries are disproportionately affected by AMR. And this has become one of the areas of focus for our programmes of work over the last four years. Since 2018, the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association, in collaboration with our partners, the Tropical Health and Education Trust, have pioneered and run the Commonwealth Partnerships for Antimicrobial Stewardship Programme. This involves partnering health institutions in the UK with health institutions in eight African Commonwealth countries to help deliver their AMS action plans, with a focus on improved antimicrobial stewardship and infection prevention control, combined with de developing the leadership capacity of pharmacists in this area. The huge success of these programmes has been down to the dedication of pharmacists, both in the UK and Africa, and the multidisciplinary teams that they have worked with. The programme has not only seen direct benefits to health systems and patients, but has also raised the profile of pharmacists in this space. The programme has now reached phase two, and we recently launched a call for applications to the next round of partnerships. For more information, please do look on our website. We've delivered many other programs around antimicrobial stewardship, including developing an app to increase accessibility of guidelines across 22 low and middle income countries and supporting countries to collect data and bring about changes in practice around antimicrobial use and prescribing. We're delighted that FIP have asked us to lead this webinar series on AMS, recognising our work in this space. And it's a great example to demonstrate the collaborative working between our two organisations who have so many shared goals. I'm delighted now to hand back to my co-moderator, Lars, um, for a few words. Lars. Thank you, Victoria. Let's uh, go over to some housekeeping rules. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed also via YouTube, and the recording will be available on the FIP and CPA websites after this um, event. And you may ask questions using the question box provided in the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box. And uh, kindly also use hashtag CPA farm and FIP digital event while tweeting. And I also invite you to become a member of FIP and you can find all the details here on the screen or at our website, uh, FIP.org. Next slide, please. So for today's um, event, uh, we are um, uh, very happy to have a full complement of most distinguished speakers to share their experience with us. So in today's program, Victoria will give, uh, give us some highlights from the previous uh, most successful events. Nathan Mugenje will talk about antimicrobial resistance and the identity app. Fiona Lovett will introduce us to the FarmVet champions. And Christopher uh, Secande will discuss the survey on disposal of 
disposal practices of antibiotics in Bakiso in central Uganda. And Diane Oredope will talk about the Antibiotic Guardian pledging to make better use of antibiotics. I would also like to bring to your attention that all of the bios of the speakers will be presented in the chat box. And please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of the event. So now I hand over to you, Victoria, again. Thanks, Lars. So as we're wrapping up the series today, I thought it would be good to begin with a, a few highlights from the event so far. Um, I'm interested to know how many of you have joined us for the whole webinar series. Please do let us know in the chat box and it would be great to hear from you too about what your highlights have been. So please feel free to post your thoughts and comments in the chat box. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. And thank you everyone for your feedback forms that you've sent in. And we're looking at your comments to inform future work and they're very much appreciated. Um, next slide, please. So let's begin with webinar one, Pharmacists in Action. Uh, we set the scene here about um, uh, learning from the Graham report, which, which was published in The Lancet in uh, January 2022. And the report reviewed data from 204 countries and territories, giving the best estimate yet of the scale of AMR globally. And it reported that in 2019, 1.27 million deaths worldwide were attributable to AMR, making this the leading cause of death worldwide. Next slide, please. So the highlight for me from webinar one was actually from Nandini Shetty's talk. Um, and as a doctor and clinical scientific advisor to the Fleming Fund, it's really encouraging to hear her view on the very important role that pharmacists have to play in trying to preserve our AMR um, our antimicrobial agents and keep them working. And this diagram was presented um, by her which demonstrates the even more essential role pharmacists have in AMS teams in the context of the ongoing global health workforce shortages. And it's not surprising that many hospitals um, that lack expertise in the form of clinical microbiologists and ID physicians rely even more on pharmacists, making appropriately trained pharmacists even more essential to help monitor and direct appropriate antimicrobial use. Next slide, please. In webinar two, it was great to be able to give a platform to Andrea Kwa from Singapore, whose work has inspired me and many of our AMS programs at the CPA. Web webinar two highlighted much of the process behind the action and the theme developed on one of the best aspects of AMS, the development of teams. Stories from Andrea in Singapore and Freddie also in Uganda demonstrated the learning curve they went through in establishing fully functioning and productive working groups. And both speakers highlighted the importance of bringing others along on their journey. Andrea's slide summary that you can see here um, showed the positives from their programme that was and a really clear message for what the wins can be from a team such as theirs. Next slide, please. Freddie also spoke about the importance of moving from focusing on the final tick box to how do we get there aspects of the journey, which are just as important as, as the destination. Next slide, please. The main highlights of webinar three, AMS, in, uh, AMS Data in Action, were presenters highlighting the challenges faced in different environments and how they overcame these challenges in terms of data collection. We heard from Anne, who focused on the importance of effective communication of the results to increase awareness and also ownership. Next slide, please. And we also heard from Lucy and Joe, psychologists from the University of Manchester, around the importance of designing tailor-made interventions using behavioural change principles, exploring the influences and keeping the cycle going. So not just doing an audit, but really using the data and reflecting on it and implementing in in interventions which actually make a difference. And this has really been the focus of a lot of our programmes of work. We don't want to just collect the data, but we want to actually um, implement sustainable change. And they've been absolutely essential in all of our programs up to date. So can't recommend behavioral change uh, psychologists highly enough. Next slide, please. The take home message from webinar four, Communities in Action, was to start small and grow. And I think you'll recognize Manjiri Gajrat here um, in the photo. I know she's got um, integral roles at FIP as well. Um, passion, enthusiasm, 
passion, enthusiasm and commitment to start somewhere saw community pharmacists in her programme grow from six to 3,000 trained in um, TB for her project in India. Next slide, please. And the ripple effect was described by Amy Chan in her presentation, illustrating the importance of behavioural change when tackling AMR in communities. Next slide, please. Tadio's work in Uganda on MRDTB was particularly inspiring as well. His presentation demonstrated that from a baseline of zero patients with MDRTB on treatment in 2011, the brave and courageous work of the track and tracing team to locate the 19 difficult to treat patients led to over 2000 MDRTB patients enrolled in the program by 2022. Next slide, please. The webinar for Eric Venant's initiative, Rollback AMR, also had an impressive impact in raising awareness amongst the communities in Tanzania. Next slide, please. And David Masoki's talk about his ambitious One Health approach to improving knowledge of AMR through training of community health workers, increasing the numbers who felt knowledgeable enough to educate their communities about the proper use of antimicrobials showed an increase of 35.8 to 100% of participants surveyed. It's also very inspiring. Next slide, please. Oh, you hang on. That's right, webinar five. Um, so this brings us to webinar five, Tools in Action. Um, this webinar highlighted the different resources to support AMS in practice from a global program with structured learning and implementation, such as our CPAMS program, international and national apps that support AMS prescribing, and an AMS board game to raise awareness of AMR, um, making AMS part of everyday work. Um, we also showcased some explainer videos that were created for patients explaining AMS and how to better use their medications. Some takeaway messages from this um, webinar were about using the local language and plain language and um, things that people couldn't relate to um, and and sort of um, resources that can really bring home the message much more clearly. And we also had a good discussion around how countries could share their guidelines and incorporate them into the international app. Um, next slide, please. In webinar five, we showcased our AMS board game, which brings me on to our competition winners quite nicely, as they will all receive their own game as a prize. We have some excellent entries, and thank you to all who entered their initiatives. And we've selected three winners, which span a variety of innovative approaches. And I'd like to introduce you to our first winner now. Next slide, thank you. So I think we have Mujeni Nathan. Are you there? If you want to turn on your video and your um, microphone and just get ready to present. Um, Mujeni is a medical researcher passionate about AMR, and he's currently the grant and fundraising officer at the Great Lakes Peace Centre organisation. Um, I know we're going to post his full biography in the chat box if you want to know more about him. Um, Mujeni, are you there? Um, and can you tell us some more about your AMR initiative, please? Can you hear us? Mujeni? Okay. Are you having trouble with our sound? Yeah. Yes, oh, yes, hello. Can you hear can you hear me, Doctor? Fantastic. Right. Over to you. We want to hear about your initiative around AMR, if that's okay. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. I don't know if you can hear me as well. We can hear you perfectly. Hello. <laughs> Hi, me, Jenny. Um, Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, it's your turn to talk now. You want to run us through your initiative? Okay, please. Okay, go ahead and share my presentation so that I can present if it's my time. Okay, it's presenting now. Go ahead and, and share my presentation so that I can present at the, at, at the moment. It's, it's on the screen now, Mijeni. Can you see it? Okay, okay. Mm. 
Do you want to start? Can you see it? Okay, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm again Nathan. Uh, I recently finished uh, my course from medical school at Murray University of Science and Technology. And um, I've uh, engaged in uh, research in antimicrobial resistance and specifically that is within global health and global health security. So we came up with an application that was called uh, uh, AMRIAT, is, that is an acronym for antimicrobial resistance identity and act tool. And uh, this application generally was to mitigate uh, the high prevalence of antimicrobial resistance, specifically in Uganda and the globe at large. So uh, on the introduction, uh, what is antimicrobial resistance? Uh, we should know exactly that antimicrobial resistance is one of uh, is one of the global health pandemics that we are currently facing. Uh, globally, we are seeing that 1.27 million deaths in 2019 were directly attributed to antimicrobial resistance within the sub-Saharan Africa. And then the 37% of hospital administration are directly accredited to antimicrobial resistance here in Uganda. The most resistant infections uh, have been uh, noticed in uh, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and malaria, and other related infections. Uh, so generally, uh, antimicrobial resistance is uh, the ability of microorganisms. Microorganisms here, I mean the funky, you know, bacteria and other organisms that develop mechanisms of uh, surviving even in the presence of antibiotics. So here you find uh, uh, you're taking medications, maybe, maybe to heal a, a specific antibacterial infection, but uh, that medication is not working. So uh, our problem statement for the application uh, was, uh, we are seeing that currently the government health facilities are using the IHMA software to track the dispersing and use of medicines within hospitals. Here in Uganda, we are using the integrated health management systems that uh, we are using to disperse and then use the medications within the hospital. So however, this system does not have features for antimicrobial resistance drug history. They don't engage patients. They don't uh, give notifications to patients and then also follow up. Also, they don't give uh, the local resistance patterns and no patient access. So here, we find that we're not uh, exercising the patient centered care. In uh, patient management, we ought to uh, use the patient. Uh, we, we ought to also engage the patient in their treatment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Hello, next slide, please. Uh, I think there's yes. a bit so of a lag. Our solution generally, uh, no previous slides uh, back, go back. Kindly go back to, uh, to kindly go back to the previous slide. No, the previous slide, you, you, the previous slide, please. So, okay, uh, I wanted you to take us to the slide where we have our solution. I, I don't know if it is possible. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I think there's just a bit of a lag between what you- Yes, can... please. Yeah. Kindly go kindly go to the previous slide that had the solution and then I elaborate more on that. Okay, from the problem statement, uh, I think I've uh, elaborated more on, on our problem statement, uh, uh, engaging that uh, currently we're using the AHMAS system. Okay, our solution now, uh, we ought to have a solution that is uh, the antimicrobial resistance identity and act tool, that is the, our application, that is AMRIA. And then uh, what will the application exactly provide? So in our solution, we incorporated patient notification. We have a follow-up on the patient that is through the real-time notifications. We're going to use the USSD codes. Uh, that is for patients that cannot access smartphones or the internet, and then they can always access this, this up, these uh, services using their small phones uh, via the USSD code. Uh, also, we're going to have the patient at health worker user interfaces. So uh, with the patient and health worker user interfaces, here we're going to have an interface that is going to be for the patients. And then uh, that will be specifically solving 
uh, the patient's needs and then the one for the health workers. Though so we're going to have another interface that will provide the information in re regarding antimicrobial resistance. So another solution is the anti antimicrobial drug patient records. So here we, our application is able to keep track of the patient records. Uh, here it will help the dispensers and uh, you know the clinicians to give a better diagnosis of the infections that could be around the patient. So also the local resistance patterns of antimicrobials. This will give us an insight uh, of exactly what is the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance and how are the patients adhering to their antimicrobials within that specific time. Also, we want to have the patient profile. So here we're keeping track of the patient information. Uh, it is going to guide the clinicians and you know the doctors on the diagnosis of the infections that could be affecting the patients. So uh, uh, basically, we are also going to have the antimicrobial patient education information that will be on the or on the interface that is going to provide you know awareness information, sensitization, and also every information that the community out there may need to know about antimicrobial resistance. So we're seeing this up as a, a, a milestone in uh, the mitigation of antimicrobial resistance globally. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. So, okay. Uh, our so uh, just just uh, was elaborating on our solution. Though um, I think um, I'm done with what exactly our solution is. And then I wanted. Uh, please, could you go to the next slide? Next slide. Okay, let me be, oh, okay, okay, okay. In the bid to uh, mitigate antimicrobial resistance, uh, we ought to have, uh, so I meant the previous slide, please, the one that is having our solution. Kindly go to the previous slide. It, it's up. You just probably can't see it, um, Eugenie. It's just a lag in your connection. So we've got our solution on the screen with the different graphics on site. On Is that the one you want? Can you still hear us? Okay. Yes. Yes, I, I kindly share the slide, kindly share the our solution slide so that I can finish up. Yeah, it's there. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the bid to mitigate antimicrobial resistance globally, uh, there, are five, there, there are five steps of practicing antimicrobial stewardship. And among these are uh, commitment, accountability, you know, uh, action, tracking, and then reporting and education. So our, our application, Amuri, the Amuria app, uh, solves three of these of these interventions. Uh, it gives a it uh, solves commitment, solves you know action, and then reporting and education. So in the bid of curtailing the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance globally, our application is generally uh, giving a solution to three interventions. That is commitment, action, reporting, and education. Next slide. Okay, our target population, our, in our target population, say that 42% of uh, the people uh, of the people globally are currently are, are currently connected to the internet. So this gives the, our application a larger a larger chance of being used by these people that are using internet. At the same time, they are using it for their own information. So with this target population, we are very sure our application is by a myriad of people globally and you know within Uganda here. So also eight million people on their smartphones. So these people are in a way going to access our application now that can be used on uh, on the smartphones and then other internet 
uh, platforms. Then also 28 million people own mobile connection. These are small phones where our application has the code that is going to, uh, you know, care for those people that cannot access the internet. So 28 million people also will be able to access our, our application and then all that its services. So also uh, we're seeing that here in Uganda, we're having over 6,937 health facilities. These health facilities are going to be, uh, are the ones that are going to be, that are going to put application into use. So this application can be used by the health workers, can be used by the patient system themselves, and then also providing general information about antimicrobial diseases. So this gives an insight of the total population that is going to use our application generally. Next slide. Next slide, Dr. Nikki. So we've got the slide up with model canvas. I don't know if you can see it, Mijani. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So the model covers in our model covers our key partners are the consortium for advanced medical technologies that is Comtech in Uganda. These are the ones that are, so, are providing us with a software, you know, software services for application and then all that maintenance, all that. Uh, so also we are partnering with the National Drug Authority. These people are doing uh, more of the surveillance and, you know, up management and, and, and maintenance. And then also the Minister of Health is giving in hand. Uh, and then also the app is, is brought up by a team from Barry University of Science and Technology. So I'm very sure uh, our key partners are going to play a, a very big role in this. Then also the key activities, we generally uh, concentrating on, pro on procurement, resource procurement, uh, prototype development, uh, testing and validation, advertising and marketing. In our value, prepo our value proposition, uh, we have an augmented drug resistance identification that is through the application itself. Then also remote patient monitoring, uh, through the real-time notifications, all that. Then also patient reminder and notification systems. So in our customer relations, this is how we are relating with our customers, through real-time notifications, SMS messages, maybe through direct calls, or also customer feedback and then client databases. So we are, we are keeping track of our client information. Then in the target segments, here we are currently targeting hospitals, pharmacies, clinics, and the patients themselves. So the key resources we're generally using uh, the laptops uh, that is for uh, the uh, application maintenance because it's online, and then uh, stationary, stationary for documentation, internet bundles, and then also the people are in the channels. Uh, our application can be accessed via Play Store, App Store, social media handles, and the websites and sales agents. So the cost structure. In our cost structure, we are, we, are, we are spending more on transport that is on the vigilance and also having feedback from our clients, also research and software development. Next slide, Dr. Nikki. So we have showing the competitive landscape now. Okay, on our competitive landscape, uh, generally oh, this application has been born from uh, you know challenges that have been hitting the healthcare systems. That is, antimicrobial resistance as one of the global health risks. And uh, uh, previously, most platforms have been put forward to solve this problem, but they haven't engaged patients. And then we are trying to bridge bridge that gap by introducing this application. So we have had uh, the. A there have been AMR websites, you know, these are websites that are providing information, are providing information about antimicrobial resistance. There's also the Medscape app. It's also doing some work in regards to mitigating antimicrobial resistance. we we'll also have the UCG in Uganda, here we have the Uganda Clinical Guidelines. These are guidelines that guide us when you are doing diagnosis, you know, and then also we are managing infections within here in Uganda. So it, it has also, been dictating, it has not been engaging patients. And also we have the Uganda uh, integrated health management systems. So in the augmented drug identification, our application is going to provide that, which has not been implemented by the AMR website. And then 
It has also been implemented by the Medscape, also with the UCG, and it is not incorporated within the integrated health management system. So access to AMR information and, and you know, systemization, our application is having that in consideration. And then at the AMR websites, uh, at the Medscape, UCG, but the IH, IHMS has not been providing that. So what is making us different from what, are, what has been introduced in that regard is that drug adhering, patient notification, and then the follow-up, for which our application generally is providing uh, that uh, the AMR website is not providing and then, then those other, other competitors. So this drug adherence and patient notification, you know, follow-up make, makes our application stand out and uh, we believe it is going to uh, have a contribution in uh, mitigating antimicrobial resistance. Uh, next slide, Dr. Nikki. So you have your roadmap showing now. You have one minute left, um, Eugenia. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So in our roadmap, uh, of course, we had to build much on research. Uh, that was during uh, August, September 2022. We developed then a prototype within November we tried to modify after uh, carrying out the research and then having the patient feedback. We did some modification that was by the NDA. And then also uh, we're going to register, of course, when you are registering with URSB in Uganda, they need legislation. So we're also planning to have our, our legislation soon. Uh, also, we are doing its advertisements and when it, when it gets markets, we're going to do the hosting and then the marketing so that we can have our clients served. Next slide. Your budget slide is showing the budget. Okay, okay, okay. The budget uh, that is that is our, our our budget. Generally, I didn't specify the amount, but that is exactly what we are going to use uh, to develop our application. We have a planning strategy, design and prototyping, up release, and then marketing. All these are going to you know. Uh, spend us uh, some some money. So you meet our team. Our our team is uh, composed of you know five uh, five uh, uh, inter professionals. Uh, our our lead principal investigator is uh, called Jonas Simiri. Uh, he's uh, the deputy faculty of medicine at Mbara University of Science and Technology. And then I'm the founder of the application and the CEO uh, of the Amuria app. Um, Genji Nathan. Also, we have other members such as Naluja Slivia, who is the co founder. We have uh, Nanja Shanita, who, who, is a, a bachelor, who is a bachelor nurse. And then also, we have an IT personnel who does more of uh, you know, the machine learning and artificial intelligence for our, for our application that is called Wesley Kampali. So, I'm very hopeful this application is going to have a great impact on, you know, improving the healthcare systems in Uganda and globally as it may, it, it is trying to mitigate antimicrobial resistance. And we are very glad for you giving us this opportunity to present to you our application and what exactly it does in this. So, yeah, thank you. Back to you, Dr. Nikki. Those are our references from where we read from. Those are our, our references. Thank you very much. I remain Dr. Mugeni Nathan, uh, the founder of uh, of the Amuria app. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Nikki. Thank you, Mugeni. Um, really great presentation and apologies for the connection. I understand Uganda's had some bad rains from our project managers out there and uh, perhaps that's affected the connection, but thank you for the presentation and um, a really great innovative app there. Um, which builds on some of the other work that's that's been done, but certainly is um, you know has its own um, place in the market as as you've demonstrated. So um, I now want to move on to our second winner, uh, Fiona Lovett. Um, so could we just move the slides on? Uh, Fiona is a clinical lead for Farm Vet Champions, a collaborative antimicrobial stewardship project spearheaded by the charity RCVS Knowledge. Um, it's really important that we consider, um, you know, not just human health, but animal health in this one health approach to AMR. So it's, I'm delighted to have you here, Fiona. Um, and I think you've got something completely different for us um, compared to the last presentation. So really um, interested to hear about your innovative approach. Uh, Fiona, are you there? Um, if you can... Thank you very, thank you very much. Yep. Uh, uh, so uh, I think I can move the slides on myself. 
Um, so I'm going to introduce farm bet champions. Now I'm a farm bet in the UK and I'd like to, you to join me on a visit to one of my farms. So here's a, a, a number of farm gates and as I drive up to one of those farms and perhaps to the, the, the um, cattle shed um, up here and maybe can hear a bit of coughing in the calves. Now, but don't imagine it's 2022. Think about it as 2042, 20 years from now. So that's less than the time since I graduated as a vet. Um, maybe in the next 20 years, um, some of us will have retired. Um, at the moment, if we have calves that are coughing or sheep that are lame, we can turn to an effective bottle of antibiotics and treat them. Arguably by 2042, we won't have access to medicines that are work that work. Um, and what what are things going to look like in doctor surgeries in in 2024? You know, we're using the same antibiotics in um, in animal um, in veterinary medicine as as people do in human medicine. Um, so we've worked really hard in UK agriculture. We've made a lot of progress in the last six years or so, um, reducing our usage in food producing animals. We only use um, antibiotics. Um, we don't use them as growth promoters. We haven't done that in the UK for the last 15, 20 years. It's only for um, clinical conditions, um, but we've worked very hard in how we're, um, we've driven down usage of antibiotics by using other methods. So the top graph is, is total use of antibiotics. Um, the lower graph is looking at high priority, critically important antibiotics, which we are aiming not to use at all in, in veterinary medicine um, in the UK. So that's looking particularly at fluoroquinolones and third and fourth generation cephalosporins. So we have made loads of progress. Arguably, a lot of that has been driven by the agricultural sectors. And um, I, I would I would say it, it should be, be driven by the vets. Um, this is a picture of some farms and there's just six graphs of six farms there and this was done by a colleague of mine at University of Liverpool a couple of years ago looking at the susceptibility of E. coli recovered during the lambing season so I'm a sheep vet myself lambing is our main time as um, as user producing lambs um, each each lambing season and if they're housed, those animals, um, E. coli is a bit of a threat to those lambs. And in the past, um, we've used antibiotics to treat, um, to prevent lambs from dying from infection with E. coli. And you can see that those farms nine, farms four, um, they've got quite high proportion of resistant E. coli on those farms. And there are farms where they're not able to um, lamb inside anymore. They, they have to turn the sheep out where it's more extensive and it's cleaner, more hygienic conditions. Um, but then you're at the threat of the weather. And as you may well know, <laughs> we're quite good with wet, cold weather. Certainly today is one of those wet, windy, cold days. Um, not very nice for newborn lambs. Um, so in our aim to, to have the veterinary profession driving um, the good use of antibiotics. We've launched the Farm Vet Champions. So this is a massive veterinary collaboration. Um, every one of the veterinary organizations, the goat vets, the sheep vets, um, British Veterinary Association, the pig vets, um, right across the board and poultry have, have collaborated in producing um, CPD training material for veterinary professionals. Um, so we have a, a welcome, um, and introduction to medicines, the legalities, the one health issues, the reason why using um, antibiotics in animals is, is really important from a human health, from an environmental health, and from a veterinary perspective as well. And then we've got species specific, species specific categories. We've got um, modules on, on cattle medicine, on goat, pig, poultry, and sheep. And we've got this communication and behavior modules, which is a little 15, 20 minute um, sections looking at why do vets behave as we do, um, why do farmers behave as they do, what, how do we communicate better, how do we um, motivate change in our profession and in our in our farmers. Um, that, that's my favourite bit actually. Um, so we've targeted this specifically towards general practitioner um, vets working in a UK 
farm environment, um, but we've made it free to access um, across the board, uh, globally, as, as well as, it, I mean, it is focused towards UK situation, but it's freely available. Um, with free access to all veterinary professionals, as well as students, as well as practice support staff. So that might be the practice manager, the receptionist, or the vet techs. Um, and the whole um, course, the, all the CPD, is not based on what antibiotic do I want to use for this condition? It's based on how do we encourage our vets and farmers to plan ahead um, in order to prevent disease um, and so planning ahead might be using the vet, getting the diet right, making sure the animals are in good body condition score, keeping good records, making good decisions. Preventing disease can be environmental, making sure um, there's good shelter, there's um, good hygienic conditions in the lambing shed, everything's appropriate and hygienic. And then protecting the flock or herd, that could be as important as the um, neonatal baby lambs, calves, piglets, getting colostrum you know that they're not born with innate immunity they need colostrum in those first um, 24 hours of life to get immunity from their mothers so ensuring good quality quantity of colostrum um, but also for the older animals it's ensuring that vaccinations are up to date so protecting the flock and herd and making sure we don't need to use antibiotics because we've got healthy animals and this plan prevent protect goes right through all the all the modules um, so I just thought I'd introduce you to um, uh, a couple of the vets. Oh, um, so this, for example, is Charlie. She works in the Lake District um, in Northern England. And using the modules like that and do, having the learning helps her in, in her, um, as she can do her CPD while she's driving around visiting her farms. Um, this is um, Harriet talking about how actually the communication modules are something she really um, appreciates um, as she's just helping her, not just in talking about antibiotics with farmers, but it can be in antimintic um, usage, but just responsible use of medicines within her within her farm um, work. And we're encouraging farm vet champions to set smart goals. So um, we've made the platform um, interactive and helping people to set specific, measurable, achievable, and realistic goals with a time boundness. So um, uh, it works that the platform works vet through they can either set an individual smart goal or they can form a team which could be their practice team it could be their um, the vets within their region or area or it could be um, the cattle vet society for example looking at, uh, at how to improve responsible use within cattle medicine and then um, they can either take a, a smart goal that someone else has used or they can um, create their own SMART goal and it will work them through and, and make sure people can make those goals specific and measurable. And it will give, and you can set when you want the, when you want to have achieved that goal by, and you can, and you can track your own progress. So it's one way to keep people accountable, to help them apply the training that they've learned and help to, to actually apply it to their specific situation. So, so some vets and vet teams have made incredible progress within their practice setting and some people are a bit further back on the journey and I think that's the case for all of us but we are best placed to make those decisions in our own situation so allowing people to set smart goals that are specific to their environment means that everybody can move one step on for their clients or their colleagues um, rather than to have something that that is unachievable or, or doesn't suit someone's particular environment. Um, so that's all I've got to say. It's um, there's free. There's about twenty hours of free online learning there. It's available to any professional um, vets, um, and um, yeah, it's got this capacity to smart goals. So yeah, um, do pass it on to your agricultural veterinary colleagues um, because it is freely available to anyone. That's me, Victoria. Thank you, Fiona. That was really interesting, and I think um, sometimes it's. Uh, really nice to think outside of our kind of silos a little bit and you know we probably don't uh, experience veterinary medicine like on a day-to-day -day basis in our practice but you know it's very much part of this one health approach to AMR and I think we've got a lot that we can learn from you um, in this particular initiative and I love the setting of smart goals and how you're kind of tracking those and everything so um, maybe we can have a look at your platform It'd be really helpful <laughs> um thank, thank you, you.
Thank you um, for inviting me. No, thank you for coming and thank you for sticking to time. So we're back on time. And um, I'm going to hand over now to our next uh, winner, if that's OK. So um, over to Christopher Thomas Sakandi from Uganda. Um, he's the chief pharmacist at um, Happy Pills Pharmacy. He's a registered pharmacist in Uganda with over seven years experience in pharmacy. And he's, he's currently pursuing his MSc in supply chain and global logistics with the University of London. And he's an active ambassador for AMR Insights and is passionate about fighting AMR by critically reviewing the supply chain of antibiotics. So this is something also a bit different to the last two, um, focusing on disposal practices of antibiotics. So Christopher, are you there? Um, and can you hear us okay? I know Uganda might have some connection problems. Can you, um, you're on mute at the moment, I think. Can you take your mute off? Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Oh, fantastic. Can you see the slides okay? Yes, yes. Oh, great. I'll hand uh, over. Hi, Victoria. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christopher. I think our Victoria has taken you through my profile. Um, I'm here to show you what we have done regarding the survey on the disposal practices of antibiotics in Wakiso, central Uganda. So um, our pharmacy is located in Wakiso in central Uganda. And um, you can go through that, that slide. And I'm working with one other pharmacist. She's called Violet Namwanda, along with um, a, a training pharmacist who is doing his internship. Uh, he's called um, Derek. So um, we came up with this idea as part of our community social responsibility. And uh, we try to expand this to further collect data, which can be used as a basis to scale it up to benefit the entire country and the world at large when it came to the AMR. So I think uh, when, when the chance came up, uh, we, we thought we'd submit uh, what we had done so far. And I think we're grateful that we managed to get through as winners. Next, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So um, what is a problem that we're trying to address with this research? So um, we've discovered that the public forms a significant section of the antibiotic supply chain, and as such, their interaction and knowledge with the, about the antibiotics should be closely monitored. So we've also noted that most of the campaigns that are coming up for uh, AMR are targeting the use of the antibiotics in the public. And none ever really talks about how these antibiotics should be disposed of after, in case they are, they are not used or they have expired while in the public. So we fear that uh, with no education on disposal, it is highly likely that these antibiotics are being treated as uh, normal household waste and they are ending up in the environment. Next slide. Um, so, um, the justification to go on with this was that uh, uh, once these antibiotics in their active form are introduced in the environment, we have discovered that it is very expensive and uh, the methods that may be used are also very unpractical to reclaim these antibiotics from the environment. And yet when they stay there, they have very low inhibitory concentrations to kill the bacteria and in which case they encourage the development of antibiotic resistance. So by understanding how people are disposing of the antibiotics in the different communities, we think that we may be able to target our efforts with a high level of efficiency. And also um, when it came to data collection and the solutions that are being provided regarding antibiotic resistance, uh, I think this has been mentioned by some of the previous presentations that will require some level of uh, of tailored solutions to the different environments where 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 we are applying these solutions. So I think this is one of the other drivers that 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 sent us looking for this information. Next slide. Mm. 
next slide uh so we'd hoped that uh if this data was collected one uh, i think i've lost you there we can still hear you okay so we we'd hope that once this data was collected it would add to the repository of data collection that can be used to tailor solutions to Uganda, but as well as to similar communities. And uh, we would also hope that uh, once this in front of the AMR drivers, because uh, most of the drivers that are being pointed out um, omit disposal. And uh, three, uh, one of the drivers that were affecting us as a community pharmacy were that uh, we're looking to try to adopt the collection boxes on our side, the drug collection boxes, but we needed to have an evidence-based investment. So we set out to collect this information from the resources we had. And uh, we also hope that this information would be used to persuade the National Drug Authority, which is in charge of uh, uh, overseeing the drugs in Uganda to subsidize the fees for destruction for those other, for the different pharmacies or clinics that would be participating in this in case it is killed up to a pilot level. So next slide. Next slide, please. So um, what does the literature say about this? So I'd mentioned about the drivers of AMR. The WHO recognizes six drivers of AMR, and it points out that the misuse and overuse is one of the leading causes of antimicrobial resistance. And uh, I think we we had a discussion and we would like to defer when we try to look through the literature that has been done so far, that there's no study that has been able to quantify that this is a leading driver. And, and, uh, and we believe that based on the replication capabilities of the different bacteria, any antibiotic resistant bacteria can still infer the same catastrophic damage irrespective of which driver it is coming from. So each of them should be considered equally and given an equal audience and, uh, and, 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 and solutions. So uh, we also noted that the United Nations Environmental Program has also noted with similar concern that the disposal of medicines into the environment has been undermined as a contributing factor to AMR. Next slide. So um, we go to the next slide. So we, we would like to look at the supply chain of antibiotics. Um, okay. um, we, yeah, I don't know if it's a lag on the line, but we can see the supply chain slide. So. Okay. So so uh, with the antibiotic supply chains, we know that it starts with the research and distribution, rather research and discovery, uh, which of which it's also facing its challenges that fewer and fewer medicines are being, dis antibiotics are being discovered. We're having a discovery gap, I think for the past uh, 30 years, very few antibiotics are coming up. And uh, here we're having, uh, and those who are trying there's a very high failure rate for those that are coming up. So I think governments and donors are coming up to, to fill this gap because no private entrepreneur is trying to venture into that section. So for manufacturers, then it, once the molecule is developed, it goes to a manufacturer where they try to implement very strict environmental management systems to stop uh, antibiotic resistance when it comes to raw materials that are being used. When you go to the distributors and wholesalers, their role is to make sure that the right antibiotic gets the right place at the right time, in the right quantity, the right quality, right price, so it can be used by the end user. Then when we see the prescribers and the pharmacies, 
basically for them, they opt to optimize the prescriptions, educate the public on the use, and uh, basically do most of the work of the stewardship. So when it comes to the public, where these antibiotics presumably end up, uh, we tell them to follow prescriptions, self-education, self-hygiene and sanitation. And, and I think very few of us think about what happens thereafter, because it, it's a fact that not all the medicine that we give the patients actually end up being used. Some of them stop these, 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 these prescriptions, part of uh, their first aid kits and the like. So what happens when these items expire? Next, next slide. So uh, in our research question, we're looking, we're, we're supposing that most of these are ending up in the environment. And we try to look at the management of household waste in Uganda. So waste is collected in most urban centers uh, through the town council trucks and then disposed of in landfills. We have a high preference for landfills because they are cheaper and they have low operation costs. And uh, the major landfill is in Wakiso as well, which takes up to 1,400 metric tons per day. The other alternatives we have uh, are burning, composting, uh, incineration, indiscriminate burning, uh, dumping, and the like for other households which cannot get this service. Uh, next slide. So what happened to these antibiotics once they're in the landfills? So we've looked up some studies that have confirmed that these uh, landfills are reservoirs for many pharmaceuticals. And yet uh, some other studies say that soil is contributing, the, 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 the soil is contributing to almost 30% of the antibiotic resistant genes that we're seeing that are coming up. Yet 80% of the clinically active antibiotics are still being obtained from the same soil. So why, why is this really becoming a problem? Uh, now, if you have the synthetic antibiotics ending up in landfills at low inhibitory levels, you'd have the bacteria that are actually in the soil becoming resistant to the antibiotics that are actually being used in the population. A particular study that has been done in Kumasi, Ghana, has shown that indeed there were antibiotics in some of the landfills when some leachate was collected. And the levels that were there were below, way below the inventory concentration. So is it possible to extract, next slide, is it possible to extract these from, from the landfill? So, well, uh, there are several methods that have been used. And I think most of the people point to the wastewater treatment plants. Well, in my country, most wastewater treatment plants only happen at the factory and I think at the national water level. But we know that in low and middle income countries, most of the water and uh, supply systems may use boreholes and, uh, and man dug wells, which are not privy to this kind of treatment. Nonetheless, the water waste treatment system is not effective when it comes to removing antibiotics from this water. And from the environment per se. So there were other methods that were used and could be effective, but we had the bacterial methods as those listed there, and they had an effective rate of up to 91% of removing the antibiotics from the water, but and the environment at large. But uh, but some of these are very expensive if they were to be scaled up to be used in communities, and they were highly unpractical per se. So given the costs of removing the antibiotics from the environment, we think that it's not wise to let them get an antibiotic in the environment in the first place. Uh, then moving on to the next slide, uh, this really just talks about the need for, for having tailored solutions. So as we are looking at the disposal of antibiotics in the environment in Uganda, we're thinking that whatever solutions that we would propose at the end of the project should be able to fit within the available resources so that they can be sustainable in the long run. I try to point out here some of the good solutions that have come up over time. Uh, one major one, which actually everyone knows that we prefer these antibiotics to be prescribed by 
uh, prescribers but it becomes unpractical in an environmental setting like Uganda, where we have a ratio of one prescriber to 25,000 patients. So uh, when, when, when it's inevitable that patients are going to find an alternative way of getting antibiotics to treat the infections they're getting. So you, you would have a self-medication that like, so this is also another area to be looked in if we are seeking for solutions in the LMICs countries. Uh, Next slide. So we look at the role of a pharmacist in all this. In Uganda, we have over 1,500 pharmacists, ph pharmacies serving up to 45 million people. Uh, most of these are concentrated in the central, I could say about 75% of pharmacists and the central region of Uganda. Uh, though the NDA is trying so much to decentralize this. Uh, because of the low prescribers, as I mentioned before, Pharmacists find themselves prescribing most of the antibiotics over the counter. Uh, this was done in a study by Pocoy in 2020, Kamba. And uh, what does this mean? That it is very practical for pharmacists in the community pharmacists to be champions of antibiotic resistance. And as such, they should be empowered to lead this role. So our study, next slide. Christopher, um, we're, we're over time now. So do you think you could just um, wrap up in a couple of minutes? Is, is that okay? Because okay. so it's a really study. important message that you have here, but we just need to um, move Okay, on. Let, me, let me push, let me push. So our study had, uh, we're trying to assess the disposal of the antibiotics, determine the willingness of the public to return these items, the expired drugs to the disclosed locations and uh, two other objectives, as you would see there. Uh, some population was 7,000 and our sample size was 363 people. We used uh, questionnaires to collect this information. Uh, most 73% of the people we interviewed disposed of their remainders in garbage. And uh, yet 75% claimed to have knowledge about AMR. So wondering, there was no correlation between the disposal and the knowledge they had. Uh, they would, 93% wanted to be re-educated and 55% uh, thought that it would be wise to be educated by a pharmacy or health, pharmacist or a health worker. And 63% had uh, leftover antibiotics in their possessions. Only 80% were willing to return them to the pharmacy. I'm rushing through these. So the recommendations we had were to incentivize the pharmacies to, to take back these antibiotics from the pharmacy, from, from the public. Uh, we also thought that uh, pharmacy-based education would be wise to push this along for the public. And uh, would also, we're also encouraging research at all levels, especially in the pharmacies, because we, uh, we are privy to a lot of information because it's like with a lot of patients. Uh, we're also pushing for campaigns and advocacy at a higher up level, maybe the Ministry of Health and NDA. And uh, we were also pushing to have these antibiotics returned to the pharmacies. So in this exercise, we were tagging the antibiotics with stickers to help patients identify which medicine should be brought back to the pharmacy. And in the same regard, we were noted, I don't know whether uh, I'm, I'm rushing through the slides, I'm at a, a slide called Return If I Used. Sorry, which slide did you want, Christopher? Continue, Return If I Used. Oh, Return If I Used. Hmm. So 74, yeah. You continue ahead. After, after recommendations. Yeah, next one, I think. Yeah, that's it. So um, um, here we, we try to contrast the, the impact of recycling on non-renewable energy resources. And uh, we would not help to recognize the impact of the recycling uh, label that has been used on most products. So we were thinking, currently using labels 
but we're thinking that uh, as later on as we do a pilot for this for this study next year, uh, this should be included on all manufactured antibiotics, notifying sub notifying users to return the antibiotics if they have been unused. Uh, uh, next steps for next year. Uh, we, we hope to implement a pilot antibiotics return project to, to canvas at least the whole of Wakiso. And uh, here we, we hope to scale up our activity of labeling antibiotics to notify people at the point of dispensing that they should return them if they are not used. And uh, we also hope to fabricate uh, beta boxes that are lockable. Uh, I, you see what, what is here, the blue one, versus -vis what we're using currently, which is a plastic one. Uh, but we are trying to use the resources as we have them. Uh, we also hope to work with the Boa Collective to have scheduled, scheduled pickups, uh, get more campaigning materials, and then review the impact of the project later on. So currently, as we head into next year, we're looking around for partners for this cause, and also we hope to rally the policymakers. So what we're doing now is uh, we are using those stickers. We are using the bins to collect from the public either way, because the people we're interviewing for, for, for this questionnaire for, for the return of antibiotics still come back and, and request if they can bring these, these antibiotics back to us. And the challenges we're having is that uh, some of them cannot identify which are antibiotics. So they end up bringing up all the medication to us, which is actually going to be very expensive when it comes to destruction. Uh, but also we are worried because we are only one pharmacy doing it in the whole of Wakiso. So Wakiso is the second most populated town after Kampala. And uh, we were worried that we're going to have overwhelming returns if, if, if we continue doing this alone. So that's why we're trying to scale this up later on. Uh, I think that is it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Christopher. I'm really sorry to hurry you up because it's a really interesting project and I think something which we really need to pay more attention to regarding the disposal of antimicrobials, not just about the use and pharmacists have got such an important role to play here. So, so thank you for present, presenting that. And um, I definitely think it's something we can get back in touch with you about, you know, and see how we can possibly um sort of help to grow some of your ideas in some of the other programs of work we're involved in um, there's a few questions and uh answers in the um sorry there's a few questions for you in the chat box and the q a do you mind just staying on and answering those um just via the chat box and the q a box you can just type directly into those um, sure i can do that fantastic thank you but in the interest of time i think we now have to move on to our final speaker um so I'd like to introduce you to um, Diane Ashu Orido. Um, she is the lead pharmacist for health associated infections and antimicrobial resistance at UK Health Security Agency. She's also got a multitude of other titles and accolades, which we're going to post in the chat box for you so you can read. Um, she's been very involved in our AMS programs um, right from the beginning um, back in 2016 when we first started talking about uh, doing this work um, and I'm really delighted that she could join us today and um, she's been the driving force behind um, Antibiotic Guardian and she's going to talk to you about um, this pledge system um, that she's developed. So Diane are you there? I know you've had some trouble with your connection it's not just Uganda that's got the issues today. <laughs> <laughs> yes I think I'm back. Um, oh, okay. I'm just going to share my screen if you give me one moment please. Thank you very much and apologies. Um, Literally, as a um, colleague was finishing, my um, laptop was making a, an interesting sound, which meant I needed to... Right, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much. Really great to join the webinars. And thank you very much for inviting me to share about Antibiotic Guardian, which is a campaign or an initiative that has been going since 2014. And um, what I'm going to do with talk you through over the next few minutes is the background to developing this initiative, which was very much developed as a national initiative, but became global. And I'll share through that journey. So my name is Diana Sherrod, where um, I'm lead pharmacist for AMR within UK Health Security Agency, which is our national public health institute. I'm also honorary chair and professor at University of Nottingham. 
And for many years, I was an advisor and global AMR lead for CPA and still very much uh, passionate about the organization. So in 2014, um, we were, I was asked to lead European Antibiotic Awareness Day uh, for England and um, I'm doing it very much in collaboration with many colleagues across the world. What we had before that was a process where every year for one day of the year, we will have um, lots of leaflets available, videos, and you know there'll be a lot of activities for this one day. Um, and at some point there was funding available to send out the leaflets. And then at another time, there was a move to um, reducing physical resources. But when it came to 2014, we started to think, how can we have a campaign that was available all year round? How do we raise, how do we go from raising awareness to engagement? How do we get some commitment? How do we even know who cares about antimicrobial resistance? So you have to think this is 2014. We're in a very different world then to where we are now with digital, with um, websites and with social media. Um, There's no funding available. It was, uh, the approach was considered risky and novel at that point, but we were able to get support from a learned body, the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, and funded a single page, and I'll talk you through that now. And we went through an evidence-based approach of how we could um, attack this, uh, this, this well, to, to how we could come up with something that would allow us to meet these objectives that we were thinking in our mind around all year round, work engagement, and then commitment. And so working with a multidisciplinary group of about 60 people, we came up with what is now known as Antibiotic Guardian. The full journey is available in the peer review publication that you can see at the bottom there. Well, in the first year, we had a single page and we thought what we could do was a behavior change approach called the if then approach. And a simple way to think about that is where people make a commitment in advance. Um, so they say, if, you know, I always use chocolate as an example. If you want to lose weight, you say, well, rather than reaching out for the chocolate, I will aim for uh, uh, raisins. You know, something that's still sweet, but, you know, you consider it to be slightly better than the other option. And you say that in advance and you commit to it, and then you publicly declare it as well. Uh, so those are some of the approaches we were thinking about then. So there was a single page created and we set a goal. We launched it in um, July or September. I think by September, we launched it fully. July was a test period. And um, we set a goal for 10,000 pledges, no money, no social media funding, um, but we relied heavily on, on healthcare professionals who were champions to, to share the, the vision and to collaboratively um, develop this campaign. Um, and we got to 10,000 pledges within three months, um, to our surprise, um, I, I, and we were very pleased with that. And it gave us an understanding of the co-production as well as champions. Um, the web page is still, the video is still the same actually, um, but we've updated the web pages both branding wise and the number of pledges that are on there. Um, and the key message is that for, for the public not to demand antibiotics, to take antibiotics exactly as prescribed, never save them for later, never share them with others, to spread the word and then to choose a pledge. And the pledges were developed in a way that different groups have different pledges. Um, so an antimicrobial pharmacist or specialist will have a different pledge to a doctor. Some of them may be the similar or the same or slightly adapted, but it's really important that those pledges were tailored. The pledges for members of the public, the pledges for adults, for those who are families. So when I chose a pledge actually, because I developed, I led the development of the campaign, I chose a family pledge as a mother. Um, and there are pledges for pet owners, there are pledges for vets, and there are also pledges for students and academic and um, and educators. So there are three different um, categories and then subcategories within them as well. We rebranded in 2017. The the bottom um, image of the global of the world map was something we discovered out of the 10,000. We developed we developed the campaign purely for England, and then it became UK, and that was fine. Um, but we realized that there were pledges all over the world. Um, which we hadn't planned and we hadn't specifically promoted, um, but that's what happened. And then we started to get requests for collaboration. And so we've been really um, grateful to collaborate with um, the National um, Antibiotic Policy Committee in Belgium, um, with Africa CDC, um, with um, South African um, Antibiotic Policy Group, and Australia as well. Um, and so we have those uh, those specific collaborations for specific countries, but also the, the, the continent of Africa. 
Um, and so these are just some examples of pharmacy and public pledges. Don't expect you to be able to read this. But for pharmacy pledges on the main page, there are primary care pledges for primary care pharmacists, secondary care pharmacists, community pharmacists, also pledges for technicians, those who are academics and those who are pharmacy assistants. And you can also create your own pledge. So the um, example of a pledge for a pharmacy team is, I will check that um, antibiotic prescriptions comply with the local guidance and question those that do not. Or every time a patient presents with a self-limited respiratory tract infection, I'll use a patient information leaflet and educate them first. And then there are pledges for members of the public as well. And some of the pledges that include infection prevention, like vaccinations, um, and also hand washing, um, which became very important during COVID. We have a range of resources, um, posters, leaflets, quizzes, all sorts, and we continue to innovate each year um, to try and keep the engagement going. We're linking with our national campaign that we had on media, the Keep Antibiotics Working campaign, which is why we rebranded so that we now have a branding that combines the Antibiotic Guardian and Keep Antibiotics Working. How the campaign spread is by um, people doing World Antimicrobial Awareness Week mostly, um, but also all throughout the year. So people will have become an antibiotic guardian on the bottom, on the back, on the end of their slides, or people will talk about it on social media. And you can see here a range of um, examples that we have picked up from social media. Um, people that that stand at the bottom left there is Cambridge um, Hospitals. The one on the top with the the gentleman and the lady. I love that one because it's from this year and they've combined the Go Blue for AMR with, for WHO and the Antibiotic Guardian branding together. And it's a community pharmacy in Nigeria, but you can see there a range of um, activities that happen. Um, we have digital resources as well that we develop, um, and I don't expect you to be able to read this, so please don't, I'll talk you through some of them. Um, we have backgrounds, um, I'm not using my background today because I'm using the FIP one, but we have the Go Blue for AMR background, and we also have a red one for the um, Antibiotic Guardian branding, and it's a teleconference background that you can use during the week, and you can tailor messages as well. Um, people are creating memes as well, and we've got some post-it notes of different messages that people can use. On the right side, you can see Africa CDC's um, promoting the Antibiotic Guardian uh, uh, pledge website, and also um, Antibiotic Amnesty. So I was really interested in the talk before because that was linking me back, was making me think about um, the Antibiotic Amnesty, which we have, which we're promoting in the UK. Um, because that's the all ideas that people should bring back antibiotics to community pharmacy for disposal, um, which I think is quite um, useful and a good way to um, educate the members of the public as well. And as my colleague was saying, the importance of the environment within that. Um, and also, um, uh, also, we have um, dignitaries um, who also choose a pledge and they promote this for us as well. So on the bottom right was Jeremy Hunt when he was a health secretary. So this was a few years ago. And then Dame Sally Davies, who many of you know, has been a great champion for tackling AMR um, with her certificate and her book. We have patient stories on the Antibiotic Guardian website, again, which provides information around AMR. So um, an opportunity for people to learn. We've also for many years from 2016 until last year, we haven't done any this year. Um, specifically, we also go um, and work with Media Planet um, and they have supplements within our national newspaper, Guardian, Telegraph, and actually last year was in the New Scientist. And we have um, articles within that as well to share the message and to promote the message. We engage with health students and our main way is through a One Health conference that we ran every year until the pandemic um, started. Uh, and we had a first year of an online conference. And then since then we've got an on-demand module that is available all year round and people can access that. I can put some links in the chat later if people are interested. This year, I'm very proud of this one, um, working with um, UCL School of Pharmacy. We um, worked with the students and we now have um, antimicrobial resistance messages in multiple languages. Um, so there's a general antibiotic awareness message one, and there's one that focuses on substandard and falsified medicines and the link to AMR. And those are available for the substandard medicines. They're available in the WHO languages, four of the six WHO languages. And for the general AMR messages, we have 11 languages so far. And you can see there, um, a Professor to Tolu, who is a, ph a pharmacist and a, an academic, Dr. Hamid, who's a pharmacist and from India, 
I think it's from India, it might be Pakistan, um, uh, who is based in the UK and, and did a, a, the video for us in Urdu. We've also got um, Hoda, who's a trainee pharmacist, who uh, provided a, a translation and video in Arabic, which is really, really very excited about this um, new project, which was led for the university, but very much linked in with the Antibiotic Guardian campaign. Educating children and young people is really important as well to us. And so we have a range of activities and often we encourage um, for them to do a competition. So you go out to schools and teach them and then ask them to write a song or write a, do a poster. A lot of this is being done actually in Africa as well and in other countries. The e-bug resources are a great one. And they're also available in multiple languages um, and please they're free for you to use their their open access our tools um and it's a way to educate children but actually really good resources also for 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 students and and um and young adults we have the antibiotics garden schools ambassador program which is where healthcare professionals um um scientists public health individuals going to schools to educate children about infection prevention and antimicrobial resistance we have our shared learning awards and I think one of the, the competition winners may have also submitted to the Antibiotic Garden shared learning events and awards and what's really good about that is it's an opportunity for us to showcase and to celebrate those who are taking concerted efforts to educate and what we again is started off for England but what we found over the years is that it's become global and we've actually had winners from outside the UK um, we have a multi-country um, collaboration um, category but actually, even with the prescribing category public engagement, we've had winners from um, from Nigeria, from Uganda, um, and also I think Sweden or, or um, yeah, I think from Sweden as well. So a range of um, countries now submit to the Antibiotic Garden Shared Learning Events and Award. All those who are shortlisted, so they've gone through a judging process, then have a video and their poster published on the Antibiotic Guardian website as a way to have a repository so that people can learn from, from other people's projects. So again, feel free to go and have a look on there. They're, they're in different categories. You can learn and see what other projects people have been doing. We evaluate the campaign. Um, I told you earlier that we didn't have any funding to be able to get funding going. And we're now in our eighth year, ninth year. Um, it has been really critical that we evaluate the campaign. Um, and I'll just give some examples of, of quotes that we've had um, uh, and some learning. You know, antibiotic guardians are motivated to reduce antimicrobial resistance and most felt they fulfilled their pledges. Um, the campaign increased commitment increased commitment to tackle AMR in both healthcare professionals and members of the public and increased self-reported knowledge and self-reported behavior. Members of the public were more likely to um, act in line with their pledges than professionals. That's uh, an interesting one for us that we discovered, um, but that's, you know, that's totally fine. And every year we also publish the latest data in the SBAR reports, is our national surveillance report. Um, just some data for you, um, and we wanted it to be all year round. That was really critical for us. And you can see there that we've gone, um, we have a range of pledges per year, but recently um, through a policy within pharmacy, but pharmacy has always been a great champion for um, choosing pledges. We've had um, consistent people pledging. I've put here the latest pledge of um, 175,000 um, pledges um, as of today. Um, I think just a couple of hours before this presentation. Before that, um, as of August, we were at 170,000. So you can see that in since August to now, we've had 5,000 pledges. And so all year round, people are continuing to, to show their commitment to tackling AMR. Um, I've just got some pledges, um, some examples here to show you by the continent. It's new data we've analyzed specifically because of this um, webinar that we were invited to present, just showing you that we um, obviously UK dominates, dominates the number of pledges, but we have pledges from all the continents, um, quite strong um, um, pledge, strong number of pledges from Africa, particularly Nigeria and South Africa, um, and then from Asia, particularly India. Uh, we have no formal collaboration with um, Asia and India. So we're really quite pleased to see so many uh, um, pledges from, from there as well. And then apart from the UK, Belgium is the uh, majority of the European pledges, but that comes with the formal collaboration we have with them. But you can see pledges from the US, Brazil as well, as well as Australia. 
Um, and then particularly for pharmacy pledges, again, we have pledges from all over the world um, and all the continents. So it would be great to see if we see more increases from those pledges. And we have pledges from pharmacy students as well, but significantly less than pharmacy teams, which include pharmacists, community pharmacists, um, primary care pharmacists, and all, you know, all pharmacists from different um, settings, but also pharmacy technicians. Um, these are just, we are going to announce this year's um, award shortlist um, this week, likely today or tomorrow. Um, and so watch out for that and we'll be posting the shared learning um, about those projects as well. Um, so I've been asked to um, encourage us to choose a pledge to become an antibiotic guardian. So if you've got your mobile phones, I'd like to encourage you to point it at the the laptop or your laptop or your device um, at the QR code and the link should come up. If not, um, it's antibioticguardian.com um, because our actions protect antibiotics. We invite you to join us to become an antibiotic guardian. And what's lovely about this is that as you are pledging live, I can also see, um, we can see live how the pledges are increasing. Um, and I will just change my screen now um, and I think we may have run out of time, but I'll, I'll look to Victoria as to what she wants to do. But please do um, choose a pledge. Back to you, Vicky. Thanks, Diane. Always inspiring. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you at our webinar. So thank you so much. I'm just always blown away. But the, I'm always blown away with the success of this uh pledge system and antibiotic guardian has just gone from strength to strength and you know your driving behind it has just been incredible so I think that it's a really good note to finish on um, look what we can achieve you know I, and um, I know there's a few questions in the chat box for you maybe you can just um, try and answer those before we completely finish is that okay um, but do do make your pledges Diane will be looking I know she will be um, and it's a really great way to kind of just register the fact that, you know, you're committed to this cause. Um, and I think Diane's just posting in the chat box if um, you want to follow the Antibiotic Guardian um, website and do your own pledge in your own time. So thank you, Diane. Um, so I think we're coming to the end of our series. And I'm sorry, we're a few minutes over time, but we're only, only a couple of minutes. So we haven't done too bad. Um, so we haven't really got time for Q&As, but again, it, they've been in the chat box and hopefully the panellists and the team have been answering those as we've gone along. Um, before we finish, I must say a huge thank you. Um, so next slide, please, um, Mila. Thank you. A huge thank you to both FIP and CPA, the fantastic teams that we've got behind this uh, programme, um, to all of our moderators that have been part of this. Um, huge thank you, and particularly to Nikki, um, who's our senior project manager, and to Ali, who's been fantastic on membership marketing and coordination uh, for FYP, who's been uh, putting all the slides together for us, and obviously Mila, who's been running these events digitally. So I, I'm sure I've forgotten people, and please, I do apologise, but I just want to say a huge thank you to the team. There's lots of people behind this that deserve the recognition. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found these um uh, webinars informative and you've learned something and you've also kind of um, come to get to know perhaps the initiatives across the globe and has it's inspired you to do something in your own practice and um, so happy world antimicrobial awareness week carry on the good work pharmacists are essential in this space and I hope you'll you know continue on this journey with us FIP and CPA are continuing to collaborate in this space so I'm sure there'll be more things in the pipeline very soon um, so that's it from me. Um, Lars, if I hand over to you, and I think we've got a special guest joining us for the last few minutes. Yes, that's correct. Thank you so very much, Victoria. I would say time is of the essence. The development of new antibiotics can take 10 to 15 years and cost more than one a billion US dollars and very few are in the pipeline. So for the foreseeable future, we must accelerate our actions while continuing to increase national, regional and international global awareness and support precisely as the CPA and FIP has done during the last weeks. And if we want our children and the next generation to live in a world where minor surgical procedures are not life threatening, we need to act now. Delay is no option. And it's very important to work on what the WHO considers to be one of the greatest global threats to human health. It is an issue that concerns us all. And 
uh, we must work on, on the international level to have impact because together we are so much stronger. And as you said, pharmacists have a responsibility to take prominent roles in uh, AMS uh, and in infection prevention and control programs within health systems. But of course, there are solutions, as we have heard uh, from the winning examples of today and during the entire program. So that's very positive indeed. Uh, as uh, Victoria said, I hope that um, you have enjoyed and been inspired by our winners today and other uh, sessions during the program. And I encourage you all to become an AMS champion yourself. The world needs you. So join us in our call to action. Make pledge with Antibiotic Guardian about how you will make better use of antibiotics and help to save these vital medicines from becoming obsolete. And now I would finally uh, give the floor to the Chief Executive Officer of FIP, Dr. Catherine Duggan, for the final remarks. Well, thank you so much, Lars, and thank you, Victoria. Um, there isn't much more for me to say apart from see what we can do when we collaborate and share ideas and really mobilise. And um, Victoria, you're quite right that the sterling work of CPA can find new audiences and new uh, recipients of ideas by working together with FIP. So we really welcome this so we can shine a light on what you do brilliantly and you can inform us about what we can do slightly differently. We've seen the pledges, they really work. Um, if you make a pledge, you kind of put your name to something, then it kind of gives you that commitment and drive. And, and we want to gather all of those up against the FIP commitments to create these calls for action. And I know in this week, it can be very sobering to think about the challenges of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And just as Lars says, setting us back a century, setting us back an idea that we couldn't possibly be safe having operations or that there wouldn't be a cure for our children or our elderly who have infections. But I think that we need to all get behind this. We need to mobilize our, our children, our families, but also as a profession. And I really loved the showcase today. I think the fact that we are always just slightly over and that we always want to hear more means we need, need to do more in this space. And I can commit that together with my colleagues on Bureau, Lars taking a champion role today, and the team at FIP that we will support CPA to make sure that we all join forces on this and to shine a light on what is good and what our profession can do. A huge, huge thank you to everybody I heard from today. I just see Lars is making a special thank you to all of our speakers. It was great. And we look forward to having more of you with more time during next year. Vicky, I'm thinking about having even some blogs or interviews with the speakers as a little side set of events that people can draw on uh, and maybe even access on the website. Lots and lots of ideas on this. And with the Commission having much to do globally, we know that there, there will always be an appetite for these kinds of ideas. Huge thank you to the team. Huge thank you to you, Victoria. Huge thank you for the collaborations. Thanks to all the speakers and thank you, Lars, as well. Bye for now. Thanks, Catherine. And thank, thank you. you Lars. And thank you all for attending. <laughs> thank you, everyone.